We're good. Okay, let me get organized here real quick. I do want to mention a couple of things about some of the things I saw in the proofs that I would like you to modify. Okay. Um, all I'm going to say here is, um, okay, just a couple of things. Overall, you guys did pretty well. Okay. So I do expect over the course of the semester that you're going to start to progress a little bit in your proof writing skills. Um, here's one thing I noticed, and this, this is just, this comes with time. Let me preface by saying that when I, if I write something on your paper, if I underline something and say meaningless, or if I underline something and say nonsense, I'm not insulting you. I'm telling you this because you need to know it, because I want you to get better. Okay? I want to be very clear about that. I'm not being mean. Well, maybe you think I am. I'm not trying to be mean. Okay? It's just I'm just trying to help you. And that's why I spend a lot of time on the grading. A lot of you'll see I have written a lot of comments on your, on your stuff. Um, I do that because I want you to get better. This course, for math majors, a lot of you are math minors, but for math majors, this is also another very fundamental course. You need to get uh, the proof writing down. Some of you are going to be high school teachers. Um, and maybe a few of you are thinking, God, this class sucks. I don't, you know, I don't like writing proofs. I just have to teach uh, high school. You, and you have to trust me on this. Part of being a good teacher, part of what goes into being a good teacher is having a good, thorough understanding of mathematics. It's absolutely true. Because you have a student that says, why can't I divide by zero? Why can't? Why can't I? Just because you can't. That's not, an, that's not a very good answer. You know? Or saying, you know, why does, why does the vertical line not have any slope? Why is that true? Again, when you have a better understanding of why things work the way they do, you can answer these things and you, can, and you become a better teacher. There's no question about that. So I'm trying to improve your, your, your skills and I'm trying to facil excuse me, facilitate understanding of this stuff because it is important. It really is. Um, first thing I want to say, and I noticed this on a lot of, uh, a lot of your, your papers, here's one thing that I want you to try to do. Write complete sentences. Okay, this, this is something that a lot of you aren't used to in mathematics, and I understand that. And you, several of you have seen on your paper that I've written this comment. You're writing a proof, you're writing an argument, okay? Um, it's not just, you know, it's not the same thing as taking the derivative of tangent of e to the x, where you just write it down. You're trying to convince me of, of, that you know why something is true, okay? So what I expect you to do is imagine that I have no idea why it's true. Imagine I don't understand math very well, okay? And try to convince me that, it, that it's true, okay? Don't assume that I know what, what, how it works. I do, but don't assume that. That's not the point. Okay? You have to show me that you understand it. And part of being clear is, in, 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 in having good exposition, is writing things out completely. I posted solutions online, which I, if I can in a second, I'll, I'll show you kind of what I'm, I'm looking for. Um, this I've seen, I've seen a lot. This drives professors nuts. Okay, and I'm going <laughs> to try to be very clear about this. Um, don't, in general, don't... Um, use the conclude. This is going to look really stupid, but I'm just I, I'm just going to write it this way because I want to. Um, don't use the conclusion. Blah equals blah to justify. No, no, no. I'm not saying it's not true, but I, you're making an argument. And I'm going to show you, I'm, I have a point here I want to make. To justify, just because something's true doesn't mean it belongs in an argument, right? A cow is an animal. That doesn't mean you should write it in your proof. Right? No, you guys, you know that. Just because something's true doesn't, doesn't mean that, it belong, that it's relevant. I've been writing proofs for a long time. I, I, honest to God, I know how to do this stuff. And I'm saying it for a reason, okay? Um, let me give you an example. A lot of you were doing this. You want to prove something. So you just, in your proof, you just write it as if it's true. And then you conclude, for example, k plus 1 equals k plus 1. And then you think that that justifies what you assumed. And it may 
but, but it's not, it's not, that's not the best way to write the proof. And I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so for example, suppose you want to prove This is going to seem silly, and this, I hate to say this, but this is going to fly some of your heads, and you're going to think, this doesn't apply to me, but it does. Suppose you want to prove that 1 equals minus 1. Okay? Well, let's just assume that 1 equals minus 1. That's what a lot of you are doing. You're assuming what you're trying to prove. Well, okay, then let's square both sides. We can certainly do that, right? 1 squared equals minus 1 squared. So 1 equals 1, that's true. Therefore, the original assumption is true. No, it's not. OK? What, this, this is relevant to this course. If you think, well, but I didn't square both sides. Well, how do you know that what you did is legal? OK? There's, so the point is, circumvent the whole issue by not doing it. OK? That's what I mean by streamlining your proofs and writing them in a logically beautiful way. I hate to, that sounds like a weird word to use, but that's really what you're trying to do here. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't end your proof with 5 equals 5. Don't do that. Okay? As this shows, just because you end up with blah equals blah, that does not justify your initial assumption. Counterexample right here. Okay? You guys with me on this? Sorry, I'm getting excited again. I'm gonna start, I want to start throwing stuff. I'm going to knock my mic off and start breaking things. Okay. Um, but overall... You guys did pretty, pretty well. I was, I was actually pretty happy with, with your performance on this. Okay? And so again, take the, the, the no, the meaningless, the nonsense, these comments, just take them as face value. Don't read some subtext to these comments like, you suck. You're terrible. I'm not saying that. Okay? I'm really not. That's not true. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, that's not to be inferred from the comments is what I mean. Okay. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and move, move on past this here. Um, ah, geez, I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to do this. Um, solutions to the graded problems, the proofs are all posted online on the course webpage. I really strongly encourage you to go online and look at this, and you see how I'm writing the proofs. Complete sentences. I'm not assuming what I want to prove in the beginning. I only assume, say, the indu inductive hypothesis, and I conclude that the statement's true, friend plus one. These kinds of things. Look at the proofs. You'll, if you read the proofs, which I encourage all of you to do, you will look at it and you'll say, wow, that's really nice. That's really elegant. And there's, you know, you really will be able to get better at writing these and you will start to approach this if you work hard. And this will definitely help you with, with your other um, more theoretical math classes, for sure. There's no question about it. So really, I encourage you to look, look this up online. But again, just to be clear, you guys, overall, you guys did a very good job. I was pretty happy. Okay. So, let's see. So, yeah, the, um, on the syllabus, um, you guys are all smart. I mean, on the syllabus, I have the, the um, website. Just go to the website. The homework, so when the solutions have been posted, uh, the homework, you know, homework one, homework two, homework three, et cetera, those statements will be hyperlinked. So, you can, whenever you can click on a homework, it's to the solutions. Okay? All right. So, let's go ahead and move on. So here's what we're going to do. As I said last time, today we're going to finish up the division algorithm, and then, um, yeah. So I spent uh, way too much time on that, but um, we're going to finish up the proof of the division algorithm, and then we're just going to do a, a few problems. Okay. So this is just a continuation of section 2.2. Okay. So again, uh, just to recap, you don't. Ha if you were here, of course, you don't need to write this down. So if you recall this set S, I'm not going to redo everything, but just to remember what we did. A minus XB, where, um, sorry, X is an integer, and A minus XB is bigger than or equal to zero. That's our set S. What did we show? So we proved... Uh, let, let me try to streamline this a little bit. We found a least element, right? I think I called it R, didn't I? 
Can somebody confirm that? Okay. We found a least element R in S by proving that it was not empty, and then we used the well-ordering pr uh, property, right? Um, so, a couple of things. I think I finished off with this last time that we know about R. First is that um, since R is in S, R is equal to a minus QB, right? For some integer K. Right, I think I used the same notation on Tuesday. Right, did I write this? Something like this, I think I used Q. And so, shuffling this around, A is equal to QB plus R, right? Okay, so everybody see that? Just add QB to both sides, that's pretty easy. Okay, and the second thing is, by definition, that uh, zero is less than or equal to R. Why is that? Because R is in S, and by definition, everything in S is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, it just follows from the definition of S, that zero is less than or equal to R. Oops. Um, okay, so, Remember what it is that we want to prove. Um, well, there's several things we want to prove. One is that okay. If you look back, and for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not going to write it down again. Look back to the statement of the division algorithm. Okay, what was it? Um, we were trying to divide um, what a by b. And the statement is that there exists unique integers Q and R satisfying A equals QB plus R, which we have. And the second is that 0 is less than or equal to R and R is less than B. That's the second part. That should be in your notes if you were here. So we have part, we have most of it. We would still need to show that R is less than B. And then at least we have the existence part of the theorem. You guys with me on this? Okay. At least a couple of you are nodding. Okay. Um, hopefully more of you are with me. R is less than B. Okay. So um, let's, and this is a useful technique in, in uh, writing proofs. Let's suppose that that's not true. This is called a proof by contradiction, which you should have been exposed to. Then, well, if R is not less than B, what do we know? And then R has to be what? Greater than or equal to B, right? Okay. Thus, and just try to follow this. It's, I don't think this is too bad. Um, let me put a star here. A minus Q plus 1 times B. Okay, and we've got a lot of letters floating around here, but um, like I said, I don't think this is too bad. This is equal to A minus QB minus B. I'll pause for just one second. You guys buy that? Distributing, right? A minus QB minus B. Okay, well, what is this equal to? This is, okay, I, I'm going to be a little sloppy here, so you for, forgive me for this, but just to make sure everybody's with me on this. What's A minus QB equal to? We have another expression for that if you look up above. This is R, right? You see that? Right up there. A minus QB is R. So this is R minus B. Okay, and somebody tell me why this is true. R minus B is less than R. Uh, this goes back to an assumption that we made that's not on, that was actually back on Tuesday. But remember, we're dividing by B. What was the assumption on B? Is that B is bigger than zero. That was the assumption. That's in your notes. It's there. B is bigger than zero. So if we're subtracting something positive from R, we have to end up with something that is smaller than R. Right? So this is true since 
B is positive. Okay, so we can conclude that. So A minus Q plus 1 times B. Um, Let's see. Um, what else do I want to say here? Um, okay, so let me just put this together first. So this is R minus B, which is less than R. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. Um, Also, A minus Q plus 1 times B equals R minus B, which is bigger than or equal to 0. Why is this? Since R is bigger than or equal to B, okay? Let me call this 1, let me call this 2, okay? First thing we showed was that A minus Q plus 1 times B is less than R, right? And the second thing, I want to, I want to be clear about this. A minus Q plus 1 times B, we just, of course, we just figured out, uh, out that that's R minus B. This is bigger than or equal to 0 because we're assuming that R is bigger than or equal to B. Okay? So R minus B, just subtract B from both sides. R minus B is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay. Um, so what, what went wrong here? There's something that bad that has occurred here that will allow us to conclude that our assumption was not correct and that R actually does have to be less than B. Um, but then, okay, look at, look at this and think about it. I really want, want you guys to think about this. Do you buy that? This is an S. A minus Q plus 1 times B is an S. Why is, how do we know it's an S? Look at the definition of S up here. S is the set of all uh, the set of all integers of the form a minus x b, where x is an integer and a minus x b is bigger than or equal to zero. It certainly has that form, right? This is a minus an integer times b, but that's not enough to conclude that it's an S. We also need it to be bigger than or equal to zero, right? But we have that from from this right here. You see that? I'm not going to write all that down, but you can just see it from what I have on on the screen. Um, now, there is a contradiction here, okay? This does contra th this information we have at the bottom of the screen does contradict something. Can anybody tell me what the contradiction is? Well, we know it's an S. There's also something else we know about it. It's less than R. Okay, listen to what I'm saying. R was chosen to be the least member of S. Here now we have a member of S that's smaller than R, contradiction, because R is the smallest. Okay? Therefore, it can't be the case that R is bigger than or equal to B. R has to be less than B. So, let me write that down. mostly have this now. Can I move on to another screen? Okay.
You guys okay? You good? Okay. So this, and you can just keep writing this in your notes, this contradicts that, yeah. About the last page. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, I probably should ask this sooner, you said A minus Q plus 1 times B mm -hmm. is equal to block. Mm -hmm. Why is it Q plus 1? Hang on one second. Let me just finish writing this. I'll answer that. Okay, so we've, this, this, uh, I'll answer that in a second. This, so now we've proven the existence part of the theorem, right? We've, we got our least element R. We know that A is equal to QB plus R, and we just proved that zero is less than or equal to R, which is less than B. That's exactly the existence part of the statement of the division algorithm. Now we have to prove that, that these Q and R's um, are unique. So to answer your question, the, so you're, are you just sort of asking where did the Q plus one come from, or? Plus one. Okay. Well, here's the here's the idea. Let me let me go back to this for a second. Okay, I mean just this just roughly. I mean, the the Q plus one. Well, why do we have the Q plus one? Well, because it it makes the proof work. I mean, that's a very unsatisfying answer, but that's really the case. The idea, though, is that if R, so think of R as the remainder. Here's the rough idea. Okay, suppose that R is bigger than or equal to B. B is in your head what you're di dividing by. Okay, then the point is then the quotient can actually be increased by one. So if you can imagine, right, dividing through, if you divide 17 by five and you say it's two, well, you have a remainder of seven, but then really you can, you can extract five out of that seven and increase the quotient by one. Yeah. Okay. That's the idea of where this comes from, okay? Does that make sense? Could it be any number bigger? Or well, the, no, the, the point is though, we wanted to choose, we don't know, I mean, the idea is just knowing that R is bigger than or equal to B, then we know that well, the quotient can be increased by at least one, for sure. But we don't know what, we don't know anything other than R is bigger than or equal to B. So that's really about all we can say. And that's all we need to say because it gives us a contradiction. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Are we okay with this first part? Any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, this thing is all jacked up. All right, I don't know what's going on here. Um, okay. Second part seems to be okay now. All right. And this is the last part of the proof. Uniqueness. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back and write everything down again, but the point is, and I, I will write part of this down, the point is, the quotient and the remainder are unique. And what does, that, what does that really mean? Here's what it means, and I'll write it down. I just want to say it first. Um, it means that if you take A and you divide it by B and you get that A equals QB plus R, and R is between 0 and B, and if you also divide it and you get that A is equal to, say, Q prime B plus R prime, and R prime is between 0 and B, then the, those two quotients, Q and Q prime, and the two remainders are, are the same. They're, they both match up. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm just going to write this down. Um, now suppose that we have 1, A equals QB plus R, and... Um, 0 is less than or equal to R, which is less than B. And let's assume the same thing is true for some other integers, Q prime and R prime. So let me call this 1 prime. A is equal to Q prime B plus R prime. And 2 prime will be that 0 is less than or equal to R prime which is less than B. Okay, so here, um, just to be clear, of course, um, 
q r q prime and r prime are all integers okay now maybe it'll, it's a little clear what i mean by uniqueness now basically what we're doing is we're assuming that we've divided a by b and we've gotten one quotient and one remainder on one hand but then on, on the other hand we've divided a by b and we've got another quotient and another remainder we're going to show that the quotients and the remainders have to be the same. In other words, Q and Q prime are equal, and R and R prime are equal. Okay? That's the uniqueness part. Okay. So there are a couple ways you can do this. Um, okay, we're actually almost done. And this is the last theoretical thing I'm going to do, and then we're going to just talk about some homework. This is not, this part's really not that, that bad. Um, by one and one prime, we get This shouldn't be too much of a stretch. QB plus R equals uh, Q prime B plus R prime, right? Okay. I would encourage you to try, try to follow along. I know it's very tempting to just kind of daydream and just write this down and not think about it, but we'll help you to actually think about this as we do it. You see where this is coming from, right? A is equal to QB plus R, but A is also equal to Q prime B plus R prime. So therefore, since, of course, A is equal to A, QB plus R is equal to Q prime B plus R prime, right? You guys see where I'm getting this? They're both equal to A, so they have to be the same, right? Thus... R prime minus R is equal to B times Q minus Q prime. Okay, think about this for a second. This is, this is not anything co too complicated, okay? R prime minus R, we're just going to subtract the R off, and then we're just going to take the Q prime B, and we're going to subtract that off to the other side. And we're going to factor out a, a B on, on the left to get Q minus Q prime. Okay, just basic algebra. Okay, we're going to use this fact here in a, in a bit. Hence, okay, let me put um, a couple of stars around this. The absolute value of r prime minus r is equal to b times the absolute value of q minus q prime. Christina, you have a, that's your name, right? Yeah. Okay. Do um, you have a question? I was just asking if it should be Q prime B. Uh, not the way I have it, because I've taken the R over here, and I'm taking the Q prime B over here. So this, will, they, this, so I'm taking this over, and then this over. So this will be uh -huh. QB minus Q prime B. So when the B gets pulled out, it's Q minus Q prime. Are you allowed to just say absolute value? Okay, so we can certainly take the absolute value of both sides, right? So... Now, the, the question is, well, how much do you have to prove and how much do you do you not? Well, um, this is this. Well, I mean, you don't things going back to the foundations of the real numbers. You don't actually have to prove these things. So the point is, the absolute value is multiplicative in the sense that, well, certainly if this is true. The absolute value of R prime minus R is certainly equal to the absolute value of B times Q minus Q prime. That's certainly true. They're the same. So the absolute values, of course, have to be the same. Why can I do this? Well, because B is assumed to be positive. That's why. The absolute value of B is B. Because B, remember, don't forget that hypothesis. B is positive. Okay? And the absolute value of XY is the absolute value of X times the absolute value of Y. You don't have to prove that. So let me just put this parenthetically. Since B is positive, that's why we, can, we don't need the absolute value signs around the B. Because it's positive. 
Okay. Now we're going to look at a couple of inequalities, and we will be done very soon. So from, see, I keep saying that, and I just keep going and going and going. You keep thinking, oh, it'll be done soon, so I can listen. <laughs> so, okay, well, we'll be done kind of soon. Um, from two, okay, let's see, I'm going to go through this uh, kind of slowly. Um, minus b is less than minus r. Okay, do you guys buy that? From this second uh, inequality up here? Subtract r from both sides and then subtract b from both sides. You can certainly do that. And um, you, see what I, you see what I did? Okay, subtract, subtract r, you get 0 is less than b minus r. Now subtract b, you get minus b is less than minus r. Okay, do you buy this? Um, minus r is less than or equal to zero. Right? Okay, because zero is less than or equal to r, just add minus r to both sides. Then minus r is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Okay, and now from two prime, we're not gonna monkey with this, we're just gonna list it. Um, the way it was, I think, anyways, let's see. Um, zero is less than or equal to r prime, which is less than b. Okay, so, and let's see if I can squeeze all this in here. Um, and I'm going slowly here so that I don't lose anyone. So what do we have? We've got minus b is less than minus r, which is less than or equal to, okay, this, I should say something about, minus r is less than or equal to r prime minus r because r prime is bigger than or equal to zero. I want you guys to look at this inequality right here. Um, I, this is really sloppy, sorry about that. Let me try to fix this. Okay. Minus b is less than minus r. Well, that just comes from this. Why is minus r less than r? Oh, I think this is horrible. Um, sorry. This might, you yeah. know, okay. That's even worse. Okay, let me erase it. It's okay. It's yeah, I'm getting. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. It's fine. Okay, I could go back to the white, but why is this true? Well, r prime is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so what's the difference between these the two sides of this inequality? This is just minus r is less than or equal to r prime minus r. Well, this has to. This can only get bigger if we add something non-negative to it. That's the idea. Okay, make sense? Okay. Ugh, I'm running out of room here. Okay, this is less than. Yeah, well, <laughs> sloppy and small is going to be really bad. Um, okay, why is this true? Okay, this isn't. This is this um, last. Well, we have one more. This inequality right here. Well, we already know that r prime is less than b from this. So what happens if we uh, just subtract r from both sides of this inequality? We get r prime minus r is less than b minus r, which is exactly that. Okay? Okay, and um, so I'm going to squeeze this on here. Uh, let's see. This is less than or equal to b. Uh, this is terrible, I'm sorry. Um, since r is bigger than or equal to zero. Right, so the same, this is kind of the same idea. We're subtracting something that's bigger than or equal to zero. If we're subtracting something bigger than or equal to zero, that's only going to make it smaller than what it was. Right? That's where that comes from. Okay, so I'm going to write this on the next slide. So what, what have we actually done now? Um, 
Yeah, this, okay. Does everybody have this down? I'm going to write this on the next slide. Here's the, here's the idea. This is the main point I want to extract from this. Minus b is less than r prime minus r, which is less than b. The point is that r prime minus r is squished between minus b and b. That's the main point to take away from this. Can I go to the next one? Okay. So, minus b is less than r prime minus r, which is less than b. That's just from that last nasty sequence of inequalities. <clears throat> so, we're going to go back to the absolute value here. Think about this. I think some of you who have taken analysis know, know about this. r prime minus r. It's just, it's just, think of it in your mind as just one number. Don't get confused with the r prime and the r. You have a number that's strictly between minus b and b. There's something you can say about the absolute value of it. Okay? Can anybody tell me what the next step should be then? What can we say about the absolute value of what can we say about the absolute value of r prime minus r? It's, right, it's less than b. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to mess up the lecture with this, but if this seems a little strange to you, just think about it. Just think about it. Suppose you've got a number that you know is strictly between minus 5 and 5. Okay? Well, if it's, if it's positive, the absolute value is equal to itself, and it's certainly less than 5. But be, because it's between minus 5 and 5, if it's, if it's negative, maybe it's minus 4. But the absolute value is 4. That's still less than 5. Maybe it's minus 4.9. The absolute value is 4.9. That's still less than 5. Because it's squeezed in between these two numbers, the absolute value has to be less than um, this guy on the right. Okay? Yeah. So, we're, now we literally are almost done. Okay, so... Recall that, okay, I, I think I denoted this with two asterisks. Mm -hmm. The absolute value of r prime minus r is equal to b times the absolute value of q minus q prime. So, what does that tell us? I'm going to use so again. Okay. There's more. Yeah. B is just shorter, and I don't like writing on this thing. Let's do the dots. <laughs> the triangular dots. I never remember which way they go, though. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like an upright one. The one dot on the top, but that's okay. Do <laughs> um, you guys see where I'm getting this now? We know that the absolute value of r prime minus r is uh, uh, the absolute value of r prime minus r is less than b, but the absolute value of r prime minus r is b times q minus uh, q prime in absolute value. So we can just replace this with that. You see that? That's where I'm getting this last uh, inequality. Can we cancel the b's? Well, yes, we can because what we can do, and this is really the proper procedure, which I'm not going write, to write out, but we can multiply both sides by one over b because b is positive. The inverse exists, and it's, and it's positive, so we have no problem with this. Okay? Yeah. Even though you didn't, even though you know that B is positive, if you didn't know that, mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, but the problem is if you didn't know, then you wouldn't know if you had to switch the sign or not because you wouldn't know if it was positive or negative. But, I mean, I think what you're asking is, suppose you knew it was negative, yeah. then you would flip the sign. Yes, that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we okay with this? Okay, so, all right, I will not say so again. Uh, thus, dots, whatever. Um, you guys believe this? Zero is less than or equal to... The absolute value of q minus q prime 
which is less than 1. Right? Where did I get the 0 from? Well, absolute value. Can't be negative. That's where the 0 is popping in um, from. Right? By definition, the absolute value is not negative. You guys buy this? This is an integer for sure, right? Certainly not a negative integer, but it's, I mean, it, it's certainly an integer. The absolute value of an integer is an integer. What's our conclusion? Look at this previous inequality. Okay, so I'll, I'll write this out. Yeah, so what does the absolute value of q minus q prime have to be? Zero. Has to be zero, right? There's no other possibility for it it's because it's an integer. And if it wasn't 0, there would be an integer trapped strictly between 0 and 1, which that's not possible. Right? What do you know about the absolute value of a number? If, suppose you know the absolute value of a number is 0. What can you say about that number? Zero. It itself has to be 0. Right? And voila, q equals q prime. That was one of the two things we had to prove, right? The quotients are the same. Now my question is, look in, and, and actually you can do this just looking at what I have on the uh, screen right now. How can we, there's another part we have to prove, right? We have to prove that the remainders are the same too. How do we know that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's mostly, you have, the, you have the right idea, yeah. I mean, the point is that this is zero. You said a little more than you, than you had to, but this is zero. So therefore, B times it, doesn't matter what B is, doesn't matter that it's positive. This thing is certainly zero because this guy is zero. Therefore, the absolute value of r prime minus r is 0. And for the same reason, r prime equals r. OK? Does that, does that make sense? OK. Yes, I am good. OK. Um, so recall that r prime minus r is b times q minus q prime. Thus, I'm going to say thus again. Okay. R prime minus R is B times 0, which is 0. Hence, R prime minus R equals 0. So, R equals R prime. Okay. That's the end of the proof. That's uniqueness. OK, yes, so that took a while. Um, will I ask you to write this proof on the exam? No. Do, do, would I expect you to state the division algorithm precisely on the test? Yes. The definition, the definition what the division algorithm says. I mean, it's a theorem, really. But yes, do you, I, I may ask you that. No, as long as it, I mean, as long as it's, yeah, I mean, you don't have to use the same letters necessarily, but, but it should, it, you should be saying the same thing. Okay, can I move on here? No, I'm still looking. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just so pretty. It, yeah, uh, now you're insulting me. I don't have to start bringing rocks to class and start throwing them at people. I've, I've been known to do that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. No. I don't bring rock. I'll bring vodka to class. No. I've been into that. But I won't share it. I just drink it myself, and then I just get really silly. Um, okay. So uh, let's see what else we want to do. Um, okay, well, that's, that is it for this section. So like I said, I want to spend uh, the remaining 25 minutes or so on uh, problems. So I feel since this is, this is due on Tuesday, I definitely want to do a, um, a problem using this division algorithm. Luckily, the idea behind most of the problems you're going to have in this section is, this, is it's the same idea for almost every problem. So I'm going to do one, in fact, I'm going to do one of your hand in problems for you, okay? And then that, that will give you the rough idea of how you proceed with the, the rest of the stuff, okay? So let's, uh, this, this is still 1.2, okay? 
you definitely want to pay attention to this because you're going to be handing this in. Okay, and you're going to have a lot of cases here. So this is going to be a little bit tedious. The square of any integer is either of the form three K or three K plus one. This is exactly how the book has worded the problem. They don't tell you what K is. It's understood that K is an integer. Okay. Um, so let's see why this is true. And you might think, well, the division algorithm, well, I learned this when I was seven. How could you possibly use it to do anything interesting? Well, you'll be, you might be surprised. Um, I don't think this is that interesting of a problem. But the point is, here's, here's what the problem is saying. If you square an integer and you divide by three, the remainder is either zero or one. It can't be two. That's, that's really what this is saying. Okay? This is the way you want to interpret some of these things. The 3K and the 3K plus one, you want to think about division by three. And the division algorithm says, okay, I'm going to say it first and I'll write it down. Um, the division algorithm says that we can take a, we, we can certainly divide by three. Three is positive, so it fits the hypothesis of the intermediate, or, sorry, <laughs> of the um, division algorithm. And so we know that three, that um, any integer a is equal to three q plus r, where q is an integer and r is between zero and two, right? Okay, zero is less than or equal to r, which is less than three, right? It's always less than what you're dividing by. Um, and then when you square, you're going to see that a remainder of two is not possible. And then I'll, I'll write that, that down for you. But what you should be thinking about using the division algorithm. Okay, so how you would prove this would be to do something like this. You would just say, okay, let a be an integer. by the division algorithm we know that a is equal to 3q plus r for some integer q and some integer r satisfying zero is less than or equal to r, which is less than three. That's exactly what the division algorithm says, right? Dividing by three, quotient and remainder. Okay, so we need to prove something about a squared though, right? The square of any integer has this form. So a was just an arbitrary integer, we're gonna square it, and then we're gonna show that, in fact, when we, when we do the algebra, what we get is three times an integer or three times an integer plus one, and then you'll be done. Can you square both sides of this? Yes, so we've got a equals three q plus r, we're gonna square both sides. And this is just pretty simple algebra. 9q squared plus 6qr plus r squared. All right? You guys buy that? Well, there are three possibilities. And you're going to have to do these cases separately. r is an integer satisfying that 0 is less than or equal to r, which is less than 3. So what are the possibilities for r? r is 0, 1, or 2. You're going to consider all three of these cases, and you're going to show that no matter what, a squared is going to have to have one of those two forms. And that's it. Then you're done. You just show it has to be 0 or 1. The 2 is not. Well, the 2, the, the two could, okay. No, the, the 2, r could be 2. But the point is when you square, you, you end up being able to, to sort of shuffle the algebra around so that you just have 3 times an integer plus 1. Remember, the r is a division, uh, is what you get as a remainder when you divide a by 3. 
So R certainly could be 2, right? So you divide 5 by 3, right? The remainder is 2. But when you square everything, right. That's what I'm saying. yes, when you, square, when you square everything, the 2 falls away. It's not possible. It yes, that, yes, that's exactly right. Yes. Okay. So case 1. And these, I, you know, I'm sorry to say, these, these are a little tedious. But um, if you see kind of what the mechanics are, these, these, several of these problems aren't, aren't that hard. Then if r is 0, then a squared equals, you guys buy that? What did you write? a squared, sorry, a squared equals 9q squared. OK, because a squared, when we, yeah. right, was 9q squared plus 6qr plus r squared. When r is 0, those other two terms are going to go to 0. So we just get a squared equals 9q squared. Don't forget, and here's where I think a lot of you are going to fumble around with, with, the, with the proof. Don't forget what it is you're trying to show. You're trying to show that a, well, in this case in particular, we're trying to show that a squared is 3 times an integer. We haven't explicitly shown that yet. But how do we do that? We just factor out a 3. Then we have 3 times an integer. I expect you to write that in your proof. Okay? So this is equal to 3 times 3q squared. And setting k equal to 3q squared, we get a squared equals 3k. And that's satisfactory, because we want to prove that it's either 3k or 3k plus 1. We've got that it's 3k, so we've, we've got what we want it. OK, case 2. r equals 1, then maybe you can see how this is going to go. a squared equals 9q squared plus 6q plus 1. You guys buy that? OK, because the r is 1, so we're just replacing. We're putting in 1 for r in that equation. Now what do we want to do? So now, yeah, so we. Right, exactly. So if we pull out a 3, then we have 3q squared plus, plus 2q. Yeah, so when, when you pull out the 3, we've got 3q squared plus 2q left over. Right? And then we saw the plus 1 on the, at the very end. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry for, for being sloppy. I, I, because of time here. I know, I, I should, you're right. <laughs> if we call this k, right, this is equal to 3k. The 3q squared plus 2q. Oh, okay. So if we call that k, then we've got q, uh, we've got, um, sorry, I, I, I keep, uh, okay, this I have to be careful about. Okay, my q's and the a's are running together here. That's why we, we need to write that the reason that works is because the closure of the integer. Oh, uh, no, you don't, you don't have to write that. Uh, I mean that, that is true. That's why it works. Sure, right. But you don't have to. You don't have to even worry about trying to prove that. That comes back to the basic foundations of set theory, and it's way beyond the scope of what we're going to be doing in here. Um, uh, yes, yes, that's right. Okay, did you guys? You guys yeah. Um, so when you are setting a equal to quantity. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I mean, every case, we're sort of erasing the variables and starting over again. I mean, if you want, you could say, we'll, we'll let k be 3q squared, and then the next case, we'll let k prime be 3q squared plus 2q, and the next case, we'll let k double prime be... You're really just setting it to be what you want. Yes, yes. k is just going to be... We, we know that a, we want a squared to be 3, in this case, we want it to be 3 times an integer plus 1. And by writing it this way, we know that since this is an integer, because q is an integer, we have it in the form 3 times an integer plus 1. So we're just going to let k be that thing. And so in uh, case 1, mm -hmm. as an example, could you have moved that b squared over and then hoping to square root of both sides and then knowing that 1 is an integer? Well, but rem remember what it is that you're trying to prove for case 1. You're trying to prove that a squared is equal to 3k or 3k plus 1. So you have to remember what you're trying to get to. Um, 
I mean, so you have this. I mean, yes, sir, you, you, could, you could take the square root of both sides, but it doesn't get you where you want to go. You can't move that over because you haven't proven the equality. So you can't just, you can't assume they're equal because you haven't. No, I mean, no, no, no. We, we know that, that we, we know that a squared is 9q squared. Okay, we, we know that because we're assuming that r is zero. We already have the division algorithm. So we already know that a squared is this. In case one is r is equal to zero, so therefore we, we do get this. Oh, okay. okay, but the point is you're, you're going in a different direction than where you need to end up. You have to always remember where you're trying to end up, and that is to show that a squared is three times something or three times something plus one. So it's very tempting when you see squares to, to sort of just go back to you know, high school mode and just take square roots and all that stuff, but that doesn't mean that it's relevant to the problem. You need to get to where we want to go, and this is how you, how you do it, okay? Or that, yes. Okay, do we have this? Do we have this down? Okay. Case three. Oops, I gotta go back to this thing. Okay. Wait a second. Um, let's go. Oh, it's on white. It's on white. Yep, yep. Sorry. Uh, no, I refuse to do that on principle. Um, Let's see. Okay, do we have class on Valentine's Day? Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to be here. I mean, I have like 17 dates lined up. There's no way I'm coming to class. No way. Um, let's see. Okay. So, just kidding. I'm, there's class. There's class. Yeah. yeah. Now you think? Of course, he doesn't have 17 dates. He's a math professor. I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm a little cooler than you might. Than you might think. I've got some stories you would not believe, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm not kidding, but yeah. Okay, not like that. But um, okay, the next case, the last case is r equals 2, right? Then, okay, I'll try to get through this quickly, and maybe I can talk about one of the problems from the other section. Then um, a squared equals 9q squared plus, okay, you've got this in your notes, if you go back to your notes and you replace the r with 2, you guys buy this? What is it? Okay, so a squared is, in this case when r is 2, a squared is 9q squared plus 12q plus 4. Okay. So, how do we get, now we, we want it to be of the form 3 times something plus 1, right? Or, well, that's, that's what we're going to, you might think, well, maybe it's 3 times something because that's another possible option. It's not, I'm just telling you. 3 times something plus 1 is where we want to go here. How do we do that? Yes, exactly. Rewrite the 4 as 3 plus 1, then you can pull out a 3, and then you've got your plus 1 on the end. Yep. Yep, that's right. Okay. Hopefully you guys believe that. I won't make you read that because I know what you do. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> no, I, I would do it, of course, but if you if you if you got it then it's fine. Okay. Okay, so there it is. There's the proof. All right, so we're running out of time, but I, I do, and I think this will, will be useful to you. This is I'm going to talk about one of your homework problems you're going to hand in on, on uh, Tuesday from the other section. I'm going to say something really quickly about this, okay? So this goes back to, uh, what was it, 1.2, I think, right? 1.2. Number 4C. Uh, I'm not going to have time to say a whole lot about this, but I, I, I do want to mention this. Prove that n choose n equals n choose r plus 1 if, sorry, this is getting sloppy. Um, can you guys read this? n choose n, um, oh, wait a minute. 
Yes, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, the ink was bleeding on my, on my paper. Um, let me erase this, thank you for that. Okay, n choose r is equal to n choose r plus one if and only if n is odd and r equals one half times n minus one. Okay. Make this a big, huge period. There we go. Okay. R plus one. Here. Okay. Here's what I want to say. I'm not going to have much, uh, time to do a whole lot here. But if and only if statements. Those of you that took the script maybe n n are aware of this. There are two statements you have to prove in if and only ifs. Okay. Um, it's a it's a sort of a double implication. If and only if means the first thing implies the second, and the second implies the first. That's what if and only if means. So when you're writing this, it's sort of a two. You have a sort of two sub problems here. The first thing you have to do is prove that n choose r is, is to do this. Assume n choose r equals n choose r plus 1, and then prove the, the other side of this, that n is odd and r is 1 half times n minus 1. That's the first part of the proof. The second part of the proof is assume n is odd and r equals 1 half times n minus 1, prove that those two binomial coefficients are the same. So there's really a part A and a part B here that you need to do. Um, so what I will say, uh, I'm not going to have time to go into this, but how, do I do, how would you do the first direction? Well, assuming that n choose r equals n choose r plus 1, we want, to prove, we want to prove this. What you do is you say, okay, well, we have n choose r equals n choose um, r plus 1. Write out the definition, right? n factorial times r factorial times n minus r factorial equals blah, blah, blah. What your goal is is to get down to that, okay? What does that mean? Think about it. We've got a bunch of factorials to begin with. This has no factorials. So you should use the inductive definition of the factorial to try to cancel things out. And if you do it right, you will end up with that. Does that make sense? I had to say it quickly, but uh, how do you know that n has to be odd? How do you know that? And this is the last thing. I'm going to keep you here until someone oh, says it. Yeah, yes. You're going, you're going way off in, the, in an area that you don't need to. Not that what you're going to say isn't true. It's simpler. It's much simpler than that. What's that? But, but yeah, okay, so when you, so that's one thing you could do, yeah, and that's, uh, well, yeah, that, that's one perfectly reasonable way to do it. Hang on one second, hang on, there, there's other things you can say too, but the point is once you've got to this point, okay, solve for n, you're going to get n is equal to 2r plus 1, so by definition n is odd, that's it, all you have to do is solve for it, okay, another way of thinking of it is, R, for this to even have meaning, R has to be an integer. And if N was even, then you'd take an odd number divided by 2, and that's not an integer. Okay? So either way. But that's the idea. So uh, I think I'll just, we have a few minutes, but I think I'm going to stop here because I'm just not going to be able to get very far if, if, I, if I don't. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that, is, uh, that is not true. I do, I do not. Maybe one. Maybe two. But that's about the extent of it. Okay. Can I your brain? Yeah, sure. Okay,